Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to this morning session once again in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this session. Thank you because you're always there for us and we are here for you. We're asking, Lord, that you speak your word to every heart, even this morning in Jesus' name. The privilege you have given us, the chance you have given us, the ministry you have given us, we pray, we'll wake up and address the issues as we ought to, and your work will prosper in every hand in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can be seated. Now we come to a very exciting session in the life, in the ministry, in the calling of Jonah. And I believe it will be an exciting moment in your life, in your ministry, as well as in your calling in Jesus' name. We're coming to Jonah chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 1 and verse 2. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. The second time. He had heard the first time, and he went astray. He did not go in the way, in the path, in the direction that God called him. And we know the consequence of that. And now another chance had come. Another privilege had come. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Has anyone there taken the ministry before? And then you went astray. You backslid. You led it. I go a fishing. And you went a fishing. And that night, with all the people that followed you, you caught nothing. And then Christ appeared on the shore. Children, have ye any bread? No, they couldn't. And so he said, throw your nets there. And they caught multitude of fish. And the Lord then asked Peter, he said, Lovest thou me more than all these? And he said, Yes, Lord, yea, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. That was the second chance. The first chance, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Eventually, he derailed and went away from that. And the word of the Lord, the commission of the Lord, came the second time. Feed my lambs. Really, lovest thou me? Yes, Lord, you know. I love you. It says, feed my sheep. And the third time, the word came unto him and said, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. It came the second time. Is the word of the Lord coming afresh to you? Is the calling of the Lord coming afresh to you? Is the ministry being presented unto you afresh? As he came to Jonah, as he came to Simon, the son of Jonas, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. The second time saying, look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. This morning we're looking at this second chance for transformed submissive servants. As uh, Jonah went through, everything he went through, he became transformed and he became submissive, a servant of the Lord. He slave to the Lord that all my heart, all my will, all my mind, everything I have, my past, my present, my future, my time, my skill, everything I have, I give unto you. Submissive now to the Lord. Transformed. It wasn't going to go the broad way anymore. It wasn't going to go the opposite direction anymore. As a transformed and submissive servant, the chance now came, a second call, a second chance, the word came and said, Arise, 
go unto Nineveh. That God has not changed, and the city Nineveh has not changed, and the call has not changed, and the man that has now changed will transform, will go the right direction. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach. Don't go and talk politics and preach. Don't go and talk history and preach. Don't go and say, I went to heaven, I came back, I went to hell, I came back, I went to the bottom. No, nothing like that. And preach, preach unto each, unto Nineveh, that preaching, that word. And that thing I told you, exactly that thing you have to pre preach in, that I bid thee. Three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the reconciliation and recommitment of an observant servant. Number two is the recommissioning and the recommencement of an obedient servant. Number one is the return and the repentance of an obstinate servant. We're looking at number one. Number one, the return and repentance of an obstinate servant. We're talking about Jonah, and we're talking about ministers. We're talking about preachers. We're talking about pastors. We're talking about overseers. We're talking about the people that are at the call of God. The call of God sounding strange, and sounding loud, and so unmistakable call of God. And he knew this is the call of God. You know this is the call of God. But he was obstinate. Not only that he was disobedient, not only that he was rebellious, not only that he abandoned the work and the will and the way of the Lord, he was obstinate in that he had been observing some lying vanities. And now, eventually, with everything that happened, he said, I will return. I will pay my vows. I will call upon the Lord that I had abandoned, I had forsaken. Now, I am available and I'm going to do the very will of God. He returned, he repented, and now he recommitted himself unto the service of the Lord. We're looking at three things here. Number one, the regrets of an obstinate slave. Number two, the repentance of an obstinate soul. And number three, the restoration of an obstinate servant. Let's look at number one there. Number one, the regrets of an obstinate slave. We're looking at Jonah chapter two, and I'm reading from verse two. It says in verse two, and said, I cried by reason of my inner affliction, self-imposed affliction and self-induced affliction and self-afflicted uh, uh, this uh, affliction he brought that all by himself because of obstinacy and he says now i cried by reason of mine affliction unto the lord and he heard me surprisingly. He heard me because God is not a man that he will say, you've done that, I'll do this to you. And even if you change, even if you repent, even if you return, I'm not going to have mercy for you again. He said, he heard me out of the belly of hell cried i and thou hadest my voice let's look at verse 8 there in verse 8 it says they that observe lying vanities he said i've been preaching i've been telling the people that they that observe lying vanities they forsake their own mercy and he joined them he too began to observe lying vanities when somebody is going astray lying vanities the devil will lie unto him you know you can fight it out with god nothing will happen to you and people can tell him you know this person did that no consequence that person did that no consequence he joined the people that observe lying vanities he might have referred to others that god has said do this and he said no they don't have chance for god they won't do that and god let them and chose another person he said all those vanities that you know came to me i observed and that made him obstinate are you observing any lying vanity the spirit of the age and the spirit of this time 
talking to your heart you can continue in that broad way in that evil way in that way of rebellion and disobedience and nothing will happen they that observe like vanities forsake their own mercy he was obstinate a servant of the lord but he became a slave to the flesh a slave to his idea a slave to personal private opinion in isaiah chapter 48 we're looking at verse 4 it says because i knew that thou art obstinate and god knew what jonah will do he knows the end from the beginning that thing you know somebody is planning i'll go this way i'll go that way he knows the end from the beginning he said and i knew that thou art obstinate and thy neck is an iron sinew and then and thy brow brass he tells us in jeremiah chapter 5 looking at verse 3 jeremiah chapter 5 he tells us in verse 3 lord at not thine eyes upon the truth thou hast stricken them but they have not grieved thou hast consumed them but they have refused to receive correction that's obstinacy you have spoken to them you have exhorted them you have you know done everything and you have even rebuked them but they have received they have refused to receive correction they have made their faces harder than a rock and they have refused to return in romans chapter 2 reading from verse 5 it tells us but that after the hardness an impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Somebody who becomes obstinate to God, he becomes resistant to God, and he persists in that resistance, becomes hardened, becomes obstinate, and becomes a slave to himself a slave to the devil a slave to society a slave to everything that is evil and then he treasures up judgment for himself but now we're going from the regrets to number two number two we're looking at the repentance of an obstinate soul the repentance of an obstinate so we're told in jonah chapter 2 reading from verse 9 it says but i will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving can we praise god for anything when we're going through affliction yes we can we can praise god that even though there is affliction there's a god in heaven that's able to reverse the affliction can we praise god at all in the time of incarceration as paul and silas came to philippi and then in the midnight they still could sing and pray and praise the Lord. Can we praise God at, at any time when everything good is reversed and we're going down and down and down? Yes, even when we reach the lowest bottom, we can lift our hearts to God and say, God, you are the God of love and the God of mercy and the God of compassion. Even though I've gone this way, I know you're going to pick me up again and lift me up again. And I'm going to be at the center of your will again and looking at the answered prayer in front of us that this is what God will do. We can praise God. And so he said, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Why sacrifice? When you are praising God and you don't feel like it, and then you have to do it like a sacrifice. When you are not happy, you are not joyful, when everything is down and everything is going the downward direction, and yet you want to complain, you say, no, I can't complain. This is the result of my sin. You want to murmur, no, I cannot murmur. This is the consequence of my evil. And you want to grumble, you say, no, I cannot grumble. And out of that affliction, even though you feel you should complain and grumble and murmur, but then you say, no. Then thanksgiving becomes a sacrifice that 
I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving, and I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Forgiveness is of the Lord. Mercy is of the Lord. Regeneration is of the Lord. Recovery is of the Lord. And then he tells us in Luke chapter 15, reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 15, verse 17. And when he came to himself, he had been deranged. He had been mentally deranged. He had been socially deranged. He had been psychologically deranged. That's why he said, I'm going to go to the far country. The man is deranged. That's why he said, I'm going to leave the father's house. The man, the prodigal son, deranged. Deranged mentally. Deranged spiritually and deranged psychologically, but now he came to himself. Anytime we're going the path of rebellion, the path of disobedience, we're deranged. Anytime we're going the path of obstinacy, fighting against God, we cannot think straight, we cannot look straight, and we cannot plan straight, and we cannot do that which is straight and straightforward. We're deranged. And then when we return, when we repent, we come to ourselves. Our senses come back. Our reasoning comes back. And our devotion comes back. He came to himself. You see, we have to come back to ourselves. The first time we knew the Lord, and the first time we called upon the Lord, you come to yourself. It was good for me at that time at home. It was wonderful for me at that time, living with my father, staying with my father, and having fellowship with the God of heaven. You come to yourself and say it. When we come back to ourselves, we reverse all the other things we had said when we were daring. He said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and to spare and i perish with hunger in this place you see when we come back to ourselves we're able to think aright we're able to make comparison between now and that other time we're able to make a contrast that this even the servants of my father this is what they enjoy and i'm perishing with hunger in this place and so he said in verse 18 in verse 18 i will arise i will arise the will of man can make him to go the right direction. There are times when a wheel has a battery that has run down. And because the battery of the wheel, the spirit of the wheel, the power behind the wheel, the human wheel, because the battery has run down, it's dead and so we cannot say i will the power is not there the strength is not there the ability is not there it's like dead dead fish will just go where the stream is going but now as you come to realize and you begin to charge that battery with the reading of the word you're charging the battery with listening to inspiring songs you're charging the battery by looking at other people that have got the call like you got the call and your battery is not being charged and the wheel is being revived and then you say now i will it will not be that satan is controlling the dead wheel there that cannot hear the voice of god but now you say i will i will say unto him father i have sinned against heaven and before thee and then in verse 19 he says and i'm no more worthy to be called thy son how do you know that somebody has come back to his right senses how do you know that somebody has come back to himself how do you know that the emotion and the will and everything on the inside has come back to themselves by what they say out of the abundance of the heart 
the mouth speaketh. Now he says the right thing, and he says, I will say unto my father, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Then in verse 20, it says, and he arose and came. And he arose and came. The first thing, I will arise. That's intention. Intention. Many people have good intention. Good intention. Good intention. I will. I will. I will. But there's no action. And faith without action. Faith without works. Faith without appropriate following behavior. It's dead. Will. Without action. I will. I will. You said that yesterday. When are you going to do it? I will. You said it last month. When are you going to do it? Many people have intention without appropriate action. But then this prodigal son, he arose and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Praise the Lord. The Heavenly Father has seen every one of us. You see, I'm going to work for God. The Father has heard. I'm going to get back to where I used to be in prayer, in fellowship, in obedience, in evangelism, in soul winning. The Father has heard you. When he was still a great way off, his Father saw him and had compassion compassion on you compassion on everyone he has love for you compassion for you no matter how far you have gone in the far country no matter all those three tribes who have joined in the far country no matter how great evil you have done compassion welcomes you home Mercy welcomes you home. And the father had compassion. And the father ran. Have you noticed that? And the father ran. It's not the age that makes us not to run. It's what is on the inside. When there's compassion on the inside. When fulfilled expectation is on the inside. When vision and passion and mission is on the inside. You will run. The father had compassion, the father old man. Because of the love within, it is not the muscles that make us to run or not to run. It is not the joints of the body that makes us to run or not to run. It's the love. It's the expectation. My son is coming. I have a chance to redeem that son. I have the chance to bring a sinner back home. I have the chance. I have the calling when the vision is there when the mission is there and when the power is there when the inner urge is there that is the thing that makes you young again and then you're on if you find yourself at 35 37 if you find yourself at 46 at 50 and you say oh they just come i cannot run see my joints and see the arthritis i cannot run no it's not the joints it's not the feet it's not your leg it's not your side is the passion within, is the mercy within, is the opportunity and the excitement and bringing somebody back home into the fold that will give you, it will give spring in your feet and all your arthritis will vanish away. I said all your weaknesses will vanish away. And he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And then in verse 21, it says, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. And then in verse 22, he tells us, But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robes, he didn't question him. How do you spend your life? Have you done this? Have you done that? When God comes to the repentant sinner, he asks no question. He says, I forgive you. 
It says, I redeem you. It says, I bring you back. It says, now you are reconciled with the heavenly father. Bring forth the best robes and put it on him and put a ring of assurance, a ring of authority, a ring of ownership. It belongs to me again on his hand and shoes on his feet. And then in verse 23, it says, And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry because there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Then in verse 24, it says, For this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry heaven will rejoice because of you can you think of all the events happening in the world can you think of all the celebrations going on in the nightclubs can you think about all the things that people are dancing about and the angels do not move and the angels are not affected but when you say i now want to be a candidate for doing the will of god doing the work of god when you say i return i return i return with all my heart with all my soul with all my skill i return even though heaven will not rejoice about a lot of things millions of things happening in the world for you and because of the decision, and because of your dedication, and because of your recommitment to the Lord, heaven will rejoice. The angels will rejoice. And the heavenly Father will rejoice because the Son has come. And it's not just a son now, it's going to be an obedient servant of the Lord. We'll come to number three here. Number three is the restoration of an obstinate servant. The restoration. We're coming back to Jonah. Reading from chapter 2 verse 9. But I, I, I was sacrificed. I, you came into this world all by yourself. The commission came to you all by yourself. The steps you take will be all by yourself. Your decision will be all by yourself. Your dedication, devotion will be all by yourself. Your determination, he has called me. I've heard his voice. I will answer by yourself. There's no point looking here, looking there, looking behind, looking to your neighbor. You see also accepting uh, that's none of your business. I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, and the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And then in chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. And as we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, here am I. Send me whatever has happened in the past as we come. He himself will take us and receive us in Jesus name. Look at Osea chapter 6. Osea Hosea chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 1. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return unto the Lord. Come, let us return unto the Lord. We've seen how it happened to Jonah. He came back. You have not been as obstinate as Jonah. And he came back, and the Lord received him. And so you can say, I'm coming back. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he has turned. And he will heal us. He has meeting, and he will bind us up. 
because all that happened from the hand of the Lord to Jonah, the Lord who has done that is able to reverse all the affliction. An abundance of blessing will now come upon you. Look at verse 2 there. In verse 2 it says, after two days, he'll revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Look at verse 3. It says in verse 3, and then shall we know if we follow on to know. Then shall we know if we follow on to know. At the beginning, you know forgiveness. Then you know freedom, you know salvation, you know reconciliation, and you know regeneration. But if we follow on to know, then we shall know his healing power. We shall know about his deliverance. If we follow on to know, we shall know about the grace for holiness and about sanctification. And we don't stop there. If we follow on to know, we'll know the power of the Spirit of God in our lives. If we follow on to know, he'll give us the gifts of the spirit if we follow on to know we'll know success if we follow on to know we'll know significance the point is as we return we don't just stay there i've got forgiveness now i've got salvation now i've got restoration now we shall know if we follow on to know the lord is going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain and as the latter rain upon and the former rain unto the earth as you follow on to know greater things he will do in your life in jesus name we start at the beginning and then we continue and great 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 wonders I wish you in your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two. That's the reconciliation and recommitment of an observant servant. The reconciliation and the recommitment of an observant servant. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the affirmed salvation of a converted son. Number two, the absolute surrender of a consecrated saint. And number three, the acceptable sacrifice of a concentrated service consecration that the giving of yourself totally unto the lord without any reservation and without any rival your strength your life and your skill everything giving to the lord without a rival and without any reservation that's consecration concentration is when you concentrate and focus on that one thing the Lord has called you to acceptable sacrifice of a con concentrated service. We're coming to number one. Number one is the affirmed salvation of a converted son. Now you remember what Jonah had said salvation is of the Lord. He had lost the joy of salvation. He had lost the assurance of salvation. He had lost the, the, the moving power and the convicting witnessing spirit of his salvation. And he had lost the victory of his saved soul. But now, as he realized salvation is of the Lord, the Lord granted him the joy. David said, Give unto me, take not away your free spirit from me and grant me the joy of your salvation. And Romans said, the spirit bears witness with our heart that we are the children of God. And that assurance, a loss and the witness, a loss and the joy, a loss and the love that comes with salvation, that a loss, all that now was reaffirmed and given unto him. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading from verse 1, therefore we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time 
we should let them sleep. In verse 2, it says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression received and disobedience received a um, just recompense of reward, in verse 3 it says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? A person who has not been saved at all can neglect salvation and he'll be hearing and hearing and hearing, but he neglects salvation. Salvation. He prays, he's praying for healing. He prays, he's praying for prosperity. He prays, he's praying for, uh, you know, the mundane things of the world. But he neglects salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? A person who has been saved before can neglect that salvation. You're giving a, a free gift, a great gift, and that gift is beautiful, and that gift is wonderful, but you neglect the gift. You put it somewhere, and it's gathering dust, and everything on the inside, the iron and the wheels are getting rusty. The battery is going down. That gift is good, but you neglect the gift. Eventually, the gift becomes as useless as safe. You didn't receive anything. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The great salvation the Lord has given you. Are you uh, kind of appreciating it and giving thanks for that? And you're taking Taking care of that, and when temptation comes to say no, a saved soul cannot do that. And when Satan comes to say no, I'm not your servant, your slave anymore. And you value, and you cherish, and you embrace, and you take care, and you keep, and you protect the great salvation. But if you do the opposite, you've got the salvation, but you don't even remember that you need to service that thing, and you need to praise God for that thing. You need to uh, do the work of God you need to obey the will of God because of the salvation you have and everything goes rusty and you look like you never got any gift of salvation before you says how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which had the force began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him he had an affirmation and reconfirmation of the salvation of a converted soul we're coming to point number two there number two the absolute surrender of a consecrated saint there are many kinds of saints there are saints that are saints by uh, the provision of god and so provisionally they are saints. There are saints that are purified by God. So, by the purifying of their souls, they are saints. There are saints that are practical. And you can tell. Look at their lives. Hear their language. Look at their appearance. And look at the what they do. In a practical way, they are saints. Not only provisional saints. And it is not only that they are purged and purified. That's explained between them and God. They are saints. And they, but now look at their lives. You can see practical. You can see in their relationships with God. Their relationships in the work of God. Their relationships with the opposite sex, the man to the woman, the woman to the man, practical saints. They are, they are pro, uh, profitable saints. There are saints that you can tell they are a prophet of the kingdom of God. There are powerful saints. And when they pray, heaven pays attention. Powerful saints. And you have to tell what kind of saint am I? Provisionally, am I just a saint? Just a saint? I'm a saint of God. Show some practical thing that shows you are not only provisional saint, but you are purged. You are purified. Purified by faith, it makes no difference between us and them. And you're practical. Your life tells the story. And uh, you are also profitable in the kingdom of God. We're talking about the absolute surrender 
of a consecrated saint. It tells us in Jonah chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 9. It says, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I'm not just going to be a saint on the shell. It says that is just there and he's part of the number. And when they count the people that come to the service, one, two, three, it's one of them. But it's a saint on the shelf. But he says now, I'll be a saint in service. I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. Lord, I will pay that which I have vowed. I'm going to put some wheels to the vehicle of my consecration. And then it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 5, and this they did, not as we hope. But first gave their own selves unto the Lord. Gave their own selves unto the Lord. They gave themselves. Look at the man. And look at everything inside him. Inside his head. Inside his mind. Inside his hand. Inside his leg. Inside his God's inside him, all the skill, all the strength, all the power, all the sight, all the vision, all the love, all the consecration, all the ability, all the agility, everything that he has. Look at the man. And everything that you find inside him, the sight and the insight, the vision and the mission, everything you find is pregnant with ideas and is serving the Lord. That man says, everything I have, I'm going to give unto the Lord. This is what those Corinthians did when it says, they gave themselves unto the Lord and unto us by the will of God. And you give yourself so much to the Lord and you consecrate everything to the Lord. Lay everything on the altar. The Lord is about to use you to do some spectacular things that had never been done in Jesus' name. We're coming to number three here. Number three, the acceptable sacrifice in a concentrated service. A concentrated service. I'm sure you know people that say they're serving the Lord and it is hitch and run. The strike now. And then they are all. They do something now, and for the next three months, for the next year, you cannot see them doing any other thing. They spread themselves thin, and they do this, and do this, and do that. They plant here. They don't even protect what they plant, and they don't water what they plant, and they don't help and keep and protect what they plant. They're just everywhere. But the one that has resolved is the one that has concentrated service that he serves, he stays there, he serves again, he stays there, and he serves again the acceptable sacrifice of a consecrated, concentrated service. In Romans chapter 12, we're looking at verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. And then it says, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then he tells us in verse 2, it says in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye renewed by the renewing of your mind, the renewing of your mind, the renewing of your mind. 
the mind needs renewal every time. Uh, have you noticed that, uh, let's say, for example, you knew somebody's name, especially a lady, and now she's gotten married and she bears the name of the husband. And um, you, you know the name, the present name, the current name, but you try to recall the name she was bearing when she was a spinster, when she had not married. You cannot remember why, because that thing, that name had not been in use for a long time. You know, our mind is like that. If, you, if your mind is not in use for a long time, your reasoning not in use for a long time, and your reading not in use for a long time, and your reciting the word of God not in use for a long time, and that mind is still there, but it's now dormant, it's now dull, is now dead. That's the reason why, as we come to the Lord and we're following after the Lord, we keep on renewing our mind. By reading, we're renewing our mind. By prayer, we're renewing our mind. By recollecting what I said to the Lord before, what I'm saying to the Lord now, we're renewing the mind. By exercise, by getting up and letting that mind see the vision and see the field ahead and run in that direction. We're renewing the mind by taking inventory. What I did yesterday, the result of that. What I'm doing today, the result of that. What I plan to do tomorrow, by the, you know, by all that, we're renewing the mind and by going out of the comfort zone I already get acclimatized to that and then doing something new and even something you feared and something you said can I go there, can I do that thing we're exercising the mind and we renew the mind if our mind is going to serve us and going to serve the Lord and we're going to do everything we ought to do it says be ye transformed but the renewing of your mind that he may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. I pray our sacrifice, our service will be so concentrated and productive will be accepted by the Lord in Jesus' name. Did I get an amen over there? I'm coming to point number three now. Point number three, the recommissioning and recommencement of an obedient servant. The recommissioning and the recommencement of an obedient servant. It tells us in Jonah chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 1, and the watch of the Lord came unto Jonah, the second time, saying in verse 2, in verse 2, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. The preaching I registered on your heart the first time. Brothers and sisters, the preaching has not changed. The gospel has not changed. The preaching that I bid thee, maybe you have been on vacation and you have not been in touch with the preaching, the gospel, the good news, and the word of the Lord. Now you come back, the same message. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation will find in Christ. The grace of God, the love of God, the power of the Lord to transform our lives. The same message and preach unto each the preaching that I bid the recommissioning and recommencement of an obedient servant. Let's look at three things here. Number one, the second chance after the first disobedience. The second chance after the first disobedience. Number two, the solemn charge for fervent dedication. Number three, the separating chasm after the fool's death. We're looking at number one. Number one is the second chance after 
the false disobedience. Let's walk to it just right now in Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. And the watch of the Lord came unto him the second time. You know, that second chance always comes. And when the second chance comes, the Lord does not want us to behave as when we heard the false call in Psalm 85. And I'm reading from verse 8. Psalm 85. We're reading from verse 8. I will hear what God, the Lord, will speak. For he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to fall in. It says, I will hear now. The fish, the whale, had dropped Jonah at the border of Nineveh. And now he's ready. I will hear what the Lord will speak, what the Lord will say. But let him not turn again to folly. If the Lord has spoken to us before, but we blew it. We didn't go the direction of the Lord. Now he's going to talk the second time. He's going to give us a second chance, but let him not turn again to folly. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, surely his salvation is near them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. When we hear the voice of the Lord again, and he gives us that second chance, and he says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and we're not returning to folly, we're not doing the disobedient acts of the past, and we'll say, yes, Lord, now I will. All my heart, all my soul, all my mind, with all the skill I have, and with all the physical energy I have, I will. Then glory will dwell in our land. Glory will dwell on our state. Glory will dwell on our nation and all the nations of the world as we go on to proclaim the might of God. Look at number two here. Number two here is the solemn charge for fervent dedication. The solemn charge for fervent dedication. We're looking at Jonah again, chapter 3, verse 1, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. What a great God that he gives you another chance. What a great God. He doesn't bear grudge against you. He didn't bear grudge against Jonah. Jonah, okay, you went that direction. I abandon you forever and ever. He does not abandon the children of men forever ever and ever and he has not abandoned you and the lord is still speaking to you again he will not abandon you in jesus name and you will not abandon the lord and the voice of the lord the voice came to him again the second time jonah and then in verse 2 it says in verse 2 arise go on to nineveh and that great city and preach unto it preach unto it don't abandon this preach unto it don't set this one aside preach unto it don't go with personal opinion and don't go with personal testimony i suffered i went to the belly of hell and then i saw this i saw that we have the scripture because the man said god uh, abraham sent one from eternity over there and let him go and tell my five brethren what i'm seeing here the torment i'm seeing here because if you send him out of the grave they will listen and abraham said no if they don't hear moses and the prophets the books of moses and the books of the prophets the old covenant the old testament if they don't listen to the word, neither will they repent. Even if somebody came back from the grave, Jonah, don't go and tell the people what you saw when you were in the whale's belly. The word that I gave to you the very first time and preach unto each the preaching that I beat thee. And that's exactly what Jonah went to do because it was a solemn charge. He now had 
fervent declaration and fervent uh, kind of presentation of the word of God in Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people a peculiar preacher, a peculiar proclaimer, a peculiar publisher. Now, as we come back to the Lord and the Lord restores us and he recommissions us, we're not, you know, so-so preacher. We're not a deacon Harry preacher. We're not ordinary preachers. We become peculiar people, peculiar pastors, peculiar preachers, peculiar proclaimers of the word, zealous of good works i pray the zeal of the lord will be transferred into every heart in jesus name let's look at number three here number three here is the separating chasm after the fool's death the separating chasm there's no second chance after death a person who has been you know on and on he hears the word of god he rejects the will of god he rejects and then he abandons the way of the lord if he dies in sin he dies like a fool not ready and not prepared for heaven in second samuel chapter 3 we're looking at verse 33 and the king lamented over abner and said died abner as a fool dies died abner as a fool dies who is a fool a fool is a senseless person senseless about a situation senseless about the coming judgment and senseless about the future died abner as a fool dies there are people who have been doing evil and they know it's evil and then they continue that evil and they are near the time of their death and they are thinking if i stopped this People will think, uh -huh, he knows he's about to die now, and therefore he stopped that. And they say they will continue so as to prove to their neighbors and to prove to their members and to prove to their people that what I have been doing to the last day, I was consistent, and I did, consistent in folly consistent in foolishness consistent in knowing there is fire and getting it walking straight and walking consistently into the fire died abner as a fool dies how do you want to die do you want to die in the fool's camp in the fool's company in the fool's compartment died abner as a fool died let's look at luke chapter 12 in luke chapter 12 we're reading from verse 16 and he spake a parable unto them saying the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully and then in verse 17 it says and he thought within himself saying what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Verse 18, he said, and he said, this will I do. It was the one calling the shot. It was the one making the decision. It was the one saying in myself, by myself, by my will, and by my position, this is what I will do. I will put down my bands and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And then in verse 19, it says, And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid off for many years, many years, many years. I was going to die that night, many years. His soul was going to be requested, required of him that night. It was going to go to the great beyond. It was going to go to eternity that very night. And I was still planning for many Many years, many years, I said, take, then eat, eat, drink, and be merry. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, but God said unto him, thou fool. Who is a fool? A senseless person is not sensible of 
the future. He's not sensible of the time he lives. He's not sensible of the shortness of time. He's not sensible of the judgment of God. He's not sensible of the chance, the second chance the Lord had given him. And he's still planning for many years when he was going off that night. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Look at verse 21. In verse 21, so is he. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself on earth and is not rich towards God. In Luke chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 22. There's no second chance once a person crosses over. He crosses the bar and he crosses over in death. There's no second chance in Luke chapter 16, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was cast carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom and the rich man also died. Do they die? Yes, they do. The poor people, do they die? Yes, they do. The rich, the popular, the powerful, do they die? Yes, they do. And it says the rich man also died and was buried. And you can think of the kind of burial that was in verse 23. It says in verse 23, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Verse 24, in verse 24, and he cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me. It's too late. It's too late. There's no second chance after death. There's no second chance after a person dies the death of a fool. Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Verse 25, and Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receives thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Verse 26, the great chasm, the separating chasm after the fool's death. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf, a great chasm, a great separation fixed totally fixed that nothing can change. Neither Abraham nor the plea of the rich man could change so that they which will pass from this to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that will come from this. Now, since there's no chance, second chance beyond the grave, and there's a second chance, even a third chance, even a fourth chance, a seventh chance, here on earth, why will you not be sensible and be wise and say, the call has come again, the call to repentance and the call to restoration and the call to redemption and the call to righteousness, the call has come again, I'll be wise and take this second chance. The chance to come into the service again. The second chance into service. And the second chance into sanctification. Into submission. Into absolute surrender. The second chance in being aligned with the will of God. And say, yes, Lord, I'll never say no to my God again. The first time I said no. And I went astray. And I faced affliction. But now. Now, when the chance comes and the call comes again, 
and say, yes, Lord, I submit, I surrender, I sacrifice. And without any rival, and without looking back, I give myself unto the Lord. Because the Lord wants us to remember Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, as it is appointed unto men, wants to die but after this not a second chance after this not a second privilege after this not a second the call after this the judgment judgment is coming and you are asking yourself where will you spend eternity you're asking yourself what will it be for you in eternity you're asking yourself what will you receive will you receive a welcome and then god will see and the angels will say joys within a restored servant a revived soul has come back home and now is home forever in heaven in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again so that i receive you to myself and where i am there you will be also i pray that privilege and that promise will be fulfilled in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I've heard your word, I accept your word. And the second privilege you are giving me, the second chance you are giving me, I am going to be obedient. I'm going to be responsive. And the Lord will show his compassion and love and mercy upon you beyond anyone's expectation in Jesus name rise up